Welcome to the Winning Edge Investments Podcast. Winning Edge Investments provides industry-leading horse racing and sports betting tips, ratings and education, enabling you to invest intelligently and treat your betting like a business. Go to www.winningedgeinvestments.com to learn more about how you can start to supercharge your betting bank immediately. Treat your betting like a business and invest intelligently with Winning Edge Investments. Today on the Winning Edge podcast, we're joined by Ballina trainer Ethan Ensby. G'day, Ethan. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Pleased to uh, to get on. No worries, mate. Good to uh, chat and hear about your journey in the industry. Um, firstly, tell us about how you got into racing. Uh, basically, mum was a steward for about 17 years. She was a swab steward um, and uh, basically grew up in it. I didn't really show a lot of interest in racing until I probably hit sort of double digits in the age, I suppose, sort of, sort of 10, 11, 12. That's when I sort of started to take a bit more interest in it. And then once I got a bit closer to being able to be licensed, obviously at, at 14, we, you know, you can't get a strapless license until you're 14. So uh, that's when I sort of got a little bit more into it. But as a kid, you know, I, I spent, oh, you know, countless times in the, you know, sitting in the steward's room, they'd hand me a, a, an old knock gear and I'd play snake on it and that it kept me quiet. And, uh, you know, kept me away out of the stewards road, but uh, basically, um, the, you know, there was a fair few times where mum, you know, there was nobody around to babysit me. Dad was obviously working, or um, you know, my grandmother wasn't around, or something like that. To so, you know, mum had no option than to take me to the races, and uh, yeah, sat into uh, plenty of um, you know, plenty of stewards rooms, plenty of. Uh, protests, that sort of thing. Never really knew much about what was going on. Like I said, they just handed me a phone and stuck me in the corner and said, shut up while we do this, basically. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, grew up, basically grew up in the shields room, but yeah, didn't really get into the racing side of things until I sort of got a little bit older and knew what was going on and went, you know, this probably might be where, you know, I could probably make a career. Obviously had horses all my life, um, uh, but uh, racing definitely... You know, I was always wanted to do something with horses. When I, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a mounted copper, um, but I'm colourblind, so I can't shoot a gun. So <laughs> that that was out the out the window pretty quick. But uh, yeah, you know, once I sort of got a bit older and sort of you know realised what racing was all about and that sort of thing, I thought you know it's probably where I want to be. So how long have you been a trainer for now? Uh, this is my. Uh, seventh season I think um, so I got my license just before my 19th birthday um, and yeah so I'm 20 I'm 26 now I turned 26 last month um, so yeah I think this is my seventh season yeah geez not many trainers get their license before they're 20 do they no I think uh, I definitely was the youngest trainer in Australia at the time yeah. um, there's there, there's a few that have got them sort of at, around that 18 19 I think uh, Billy Healy knocked me off my uh, my little perch there as the youngest trainer when he comes through. I'm pretty sure he got his when he was 18, just before his 19th birthday too. So he's been going for a little while now. He's a couple of years younger than me. But, uh, yeah, not many sort of get into it. It's sort of like, you know, a lot of people look at me and they go, oh, you know, you're a bit too young to be a trainer, aren't you? And, you know, it's sort of, I, I get that a lot. But or not not so much nowadays. I think the, the old age has hit me pretty quickly. I think, you know, getting a trainer's <laughs> license adds 10 years to your life and I've got the greys coming through and oh, no. that middle age spread. So it's not real, not looking real promising, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're starting to look, look, look more like a trainer after a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, yeah, like I said, I think it adds 10 years to your life. But anyway, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> what's, the, what's the hardest part about, or one, being a trainer, but being a trainer at a young age? Uh, attracting owners. Attracting owners, attracting clients. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, you know an, an old man sort of a sport, um, and you know you've got to do a lot to prove yourself uh, as a younger trainer. I, I guess one thing that probably annoys me a lot is the fact that people sort of look at you and because you're young, they don't think you know what you're talking about. Um, and I'm not saying I know more or any of us younger trainers know more than the older fellas, but I think nowadays with uh, technology the way it is, 
it's a lot easier for us to adapt to new things. Um, and I think that's at, attributes to a lot of the success that a lot of us younger trainers have. You know, like you know, you know, Costa's Michael Costa's not a not a um, old trainer by any means. I think you know he's got a few years on me, obviously, but you know he's absolutely killing it up there on the Gold Coast and. And it's surely because he's adapted to new things. And I think you, you, you'll start to see over the next few years, us younger trainers will start to take over because um, the older fellas, they just don't want to, they don't want to adapt. They don't want to try new things. Yep. Yeah, well, communication's a big thing. And, you know, a lot of older trainers don't even know how to use it, you know, a smartphone nowadays. So, yeah. you know, communicating with owners is, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, oh, how do you pull it, put it, I suppose, uh, foreign to those older fellas they said it you know expect you to just pick up a newspaper and have a look and see if your horse is in there and you know newspapers are nearly non-existent these days so it's sort of yeah it's I think the younger trainers will start to dominate shortly um and just surely because technology's sort of taken over you know just being a horseman nowadays doesn't doesn't get you you know as far as what it used to you know if you're sort of a bit of a rocket scientist you can you're going to probably, probably get a couple of steps ahead of uh, blokes that are, you know, just sheerly horsemen. Yeah. Before you took your trainer's licence out, did you work for any other stables or um, anything like that? Or Yeah, look, I I originally wanted to be a jockey. Um, obviously, I've rode since before I could walk. So, the you know, naturally, people who have sort of gone through pony club and get into this, you know, pony club camp draft and that sort of thing when they're kids and get into this, you, you know, the most thrilling thing you want to do is ride. Um, and I just, like, I'm a, I'm a fairly tall person and none of my family are, are, are skinny by any means. So I was always sort of, you know, had the odds against me from the get go, but uh, I, I gave it a bit of a crack and was never going to make it. So, you know, I just stuck to the track work side of things. I worked for a lot of different smaller trainers around this area. I never went to any of the big stables um, and and learnt my craft there. But I think that I'm probably better off going down the path that I did go down. Not saying that, uh, you know, I learnt more off the fellas around here, but um, I got to see a different variety. And I think if you go to the bigger stables, Unless you're a foreman or a track work rider, like a head track work rider, um, or you know, assistant trainer or something like that, if you're just a stable hand or just a normal old track work rider, you're not going to learn that much because yep. you're just a number. You just so do the you, same thing each day. Got, well, basically, yeah. And unless you've got that more hands-on sort of, you know, you're doing worksheets, you're doing feeds, you're doing this, you're doing that. You 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 know, you just don't you don't really learn anything. So, whereas I've learned a lot off a lot of different. Uh, trainers and everybody's got their own different way of doing things and, and and that's one thing I did learn is you know working for you know countless people around here is no two trainers were the same and um, I think you learn more off the people you don't really have much an opinion of because you watch what they do and you go well I don't think that works I don't think that's right so I'm not going to do that you learn what not to do um, but I had some really good mentors, Pete, Pete, uh, Pete Stanley in Casino, Pete and Diane Stanley. They never had a big team, but um, obviously Peter was a, a very good um, jockey in his own right. He rode for, you know, he was apprentice to Theo Green, rode for TJ Smith, Bart Cummings, those blokes back in those days. Obviously his son, Justin Stanley, is one of the best riders in Queensland, one of the most underrated riders in Queensland. And uh, Casey, you know, she, she rode fairly well around here too um but uh pete pete's like a sponge you know if if someone's got if there's something to be learned pete will take it in he you know reads a lot of books and obviously you know listen to a lot of what theo and bart and tj and that had to say and he's the first one to pass on that information you know what he's learned to you as, as best he can and um you know, I learned a lot off Pete. Like I said, he never had huge numbers and he's, you know, not getting winners every every time he goes to the races. But I still learned a hell of a lot off Pete um, from what he'd learned back in those days as well. Is there one main thing that you think um, sort of shaped your career? Is there one main thing which you took from him that you've, you've incorporated into your own career? 
Uh, more the feeding side of things, you know, he sort of, he was he's very big on feeding, um, and feeding to, to what you work. Like, so if you, you know, you're working them hard, you've got to feed them big. And if you, if you're working them soft, you, you know, don't feed them quite as much, but, uh, or, you know, not quite as concentrated, you know, so, um, things like that, um, working them, obviously picking up different things, little sort of, uh, you know, old sort of remedies for different things as well. He was sort of big on those sort of things. Um, and just sort of, you know, different things in general. Like he always said that uh, if the greatest mug comes up to you and says you're doing something wrong, you know, you, you're more than likely doing something wrong and it's very, very obvious. So <laughs> fix it very quickly. You know, that was one of his one of his greatest, you know, best aims. And he learned that off, off Theo because uh, I think one day he... he uh, slaughtered one when he was an apprentice and uh, somebody um, had a go at him in the car park and Pete sort of threw a bit of, bit of you know, cheek back at him and, he, and old Theo pulled him inside and said, listen, obviously this bloke's seen you do something, you think he's an idiot, but he's seen you do something wrong. You probably have done it wrong. And if it's that obvious, fix it, you know? So, and that was one thing Pete always said to me. He said, you know, like if you, you know, you've got to watch things, you've got to learn things, and you've got to listen for, listen to everyone because they might not be right, but something they might have picked up, you might be able to go, well, yeah, I did do that wrong. You know, I'm, I've got to fix it. So, yeah, no, he was, you know, little things like that. Pete was full of those sort of philosophical little little things, I guess you could call them. Yeah. Have you got any sprays in the car park at Ballon before? Or? Uh, no, I've got a few sprays through emails and stuff like that yep. you know the good old good old keyboard warriors get on there and uh they like to give you a spray um i'm known for giving a spray um i you know i i don't hold back um few few uh few what's documents. the best one you've given uh nori masood has copped a couple off me that have been pretty handy um uh, Ed O'Rourke will, will vouch for the one at Grafton last year. He uh, he pulled me aside and said, "Mate, I've never seen anything like that. That was that was gold, but maybe you mightn't want to do it in the middle of the mountain yard." And I said, "Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't cop, you know, I don't cop crap. I, you know, I'll I'll let you know what I really think, and um, you know, it's, I call a spade a spade, and some people don't like it, and but you know, I'd rather be honest and." And, uh, you know, get it off my chest and I, I usually yeah, get over it pretty quickly. Yep. Has he yeah. um, has slaughtered one again like that before or after that spray or pretty good? Uh, no, I ended up giving him a suspension for a little while. He didn't ride for me for, for a little while, not long after it. And uh, the, exp the suspension might have been a little bit too long because uh, <laughs> first meeting I threw him back on, he, he, he rode a double for me. First two horses he was on, he rode a double for me. It's oh, perfect. So, I, uh, I Keep had him hungry. To, uh, eat, yeah, I had to eat humble pie actually, and, <laughs> and turn around and said, "Oh, maybe that suspension lasted a little bit too long." And uh, you know, he's, he's raised a couple of winners for me since, and, and we're back flying again. So uh, we've got a great relationship, Nori and I. And uh, you know, I mightn't be the best trainer, he mightn't be the best rider, but uh, something we do together obviously clicked, and uh, we've got a pretty good, pretty good little association. So uh, it's it's good that we've been able to. Uh, Bury the hatchet, and he's he's back in the camp. Tell us about the um the Northern Rivers racing scene. What's it What's it like? Uh, it's different. It's different. There's uh, sort of a little bit too far away from Sydney, so we sort of get a little bit forgotten about. Um, as far as you know, supporting that from from uh, racing New South Wales, but uh, it's good in the fact that we've got you know we can. Bounce across the border uh, to Queensland. Brisbane's only, you know, two and a half hours away. So, um, well, that's on a bad day. You can sort of get there a bit quicker most of the time. But, you know, Gold Coast is within an hour and a half. Uh, Bow Desert's within two hours and that. So we've got the best of both worlds. You know, we're still eligible for your Tab Highways, um, Kosciuszko's Country Championships, all that jazz down here, Bob's, um, and obviously the good country prize money in New South Wales. But at the same time as, you know, we can shoot just up the road and we've got, you know, Metropolitan Racing, you know, within two and a half hours of here. So we've sort of got the full spectrum of, of racing. We've, we're probably a little bit light on with non-tab racing and, and half-tab sort of races. So placement of your sort of second stringers can be a little bit difficult. You've got to sort of travel a little bit, you know, to, to get to sort of, you know, your deep waters and that sort of thing. But, 
you know, if you strive to have a, a team that doesn't have those second stringers, you know, you, you probably don't have that problem. But it'd be nice to see a, a few sort of more lower grade of races around here for those second stringers. But at the same time, um, you know, the, the tab money's just as good. So, you know, if you can move them on to, to somebody else smaller, then you do it. But, it, you know, if you can hang on to horses and place them a little bit, bit uh bit better you you know you you uh we can keep our numbers up a little bit more but at the end of the day we have truck we'll travel with we, you know we'll, we'll go anywhere to, to get a winner we've you know been as far south as uh we, we've had runners in sydney we've been as far west as tamworth they were you know frequently going to, to uh toowoomba so uh, a few little hit and run missions up there have been pretty pretty handy for us so um yeah, look, you get the best of both worlds, but it'd be nicer to get a little bit more support from, from down south. But uh, at the end of the day, obviously, New South Wales doesn't want their money going into Queensland. At, at, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's yep. un- understandable. <laughs> yep. Yeah, is, is that the main the main gripe you've got with the funding? Is it from New South Wales, racing New South Wales, um, sort of being reluctant to give money which might go to Queensland? Yeah. I understand why they do it, but at the same time, you know, like it, it'd be, uh, it'd be nice to get the same sort of su- support as what, uh, you know, Scone and Tamworth and them sort of places yeah. get. They, you know, they, they get money splashed at them all the time and, you know, um, better facilities up here with all our tracks, you know, like I think when, you know, when we get winners and stuff like that with, um, you know, it just makes it all the, all the more, uh, I suppose, um, special because you've had to work that little bit harder because you you know you, you we don't have um you know the the a class facilities um that you know Tamworth and Skane and all those sort of places have they're a little bit closer to Sydney so it's a bit easier for them to run down for those tab highways and that but uh you know we we do we do a good job we you know with the the good part about us up here is we we've had to learn to adapt to different things and the clubs do their best and you know we we've we've recently work with the club here to um, do a bit of work on our sand track and, uh, you know, the results that all of us trainers here in Ballina have, have got um, since that uh, little upgrade was done um, is, you know, I think the, the about two weeks later, I think we, Ballina trained three or four um, um, midweek Metropolitan winners, you know. So, you know, we... The little things like that, we you know, we don't need much to uh, to, to get us to the mark, but it's just a, a little bit of help would be good. Is Ballina your favourite track up there, or? Uh, no, I love my hometown in Casino. Um, people probably think I'm stupid, but uh, Casino, you know, it's always good to go home and get a winner at Casino. Um, they always say it's very difficult to get winners at Grafton. Grafton's a very hard place to get a winner at, but uh, Grafton's been our most successful track. Um, so uh, that you know, if that if that's the case, then we've done pretty well. But uh, my favourite track's probably Tamworth. I've been there twice, and I don't know why, but I absolutely love the joint. I'd move there in a heartbeat, but uh, you know, it's a little bit too cold out there for us. So. Yeah, it's freezing. <laughs> How far is that for you? Uh, we usually go the day before. I think it's about six, six and a half hours off memory. I haven't. Uh, we went to the Mornington last year, so Tamworth Cup Day last year, I think it was, um, and off memory it was about six and a half hours. Yeah. Yep. But it's been some uh, worthwhile trips. Yeah, the last one, last one we went to wasn't, but uh, the first time I went out there, um, we had a real fruitful day. I think I got a couple of placings and and uh, and a winner with the Turbo Star, who he he won like a real good horse, and we went to Sydney and un- unfortunately broke down in a, in a race in Sydney. But uh, he, um, you know, he was a real good winner out there. We've we've uh, like I said, we've only been there twice, but the first time we went out there, we had it, we had a fair bit of luck actually. What was that good horse you took to Dooman for the staying races, um, uh, Torrens? Torrens, yeah, yeah. He's he's uh, actually down in Sydney now. Um, the uh, the connections, uh, the overseas connections, want to keep him as a stallion. Um, and obviously, to be a, a stallion proposition, you've got to win stallion making races. There's no stallion making races in in, uh, in northern New South Wales, and yeah. very very limited opportunities in uh, in Queensland for a stayer. Actually, there's probably zero opportunities for 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 a stayer stallion making races up there. But uh, they've sent him down to um, to Laurie Parker in in Sydney, and uh, you know respect the decision. Um, obviously, would love to have kept him up here. I think 
I had plans to to geld him, and that was I think the one of the decisions um, that uh, that prompted them to move him down there. As I did, you know, recommend that gelding him would would make a, a far better horse. Um, and I, I thought that uh, if we gelded him, we could have been a live chance in a Grafton Cup. Um, but he's gone down there. He's had a couple of trials down there for Laurie, and uh, I'm sure he'll be hitting the tracks down there shortly. And I'm sure if uh, he, if he doesn't make the marks down there, uh, you know, we, like we might back. get a shot back with him again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, uh, hard, for, hard for a young trainer like yourself to have horses like that taken off you, and or not, or moves, I guess. Um, and then, you know, your good horses, which you take to to Sydney, break down. How do you how do you get over that stuff? Yeah, look, uh, the the turbo star thing in Sydney was um, that was that was devastating. That uh, you know, you, nothing worse than uh, coming home with an empty float, uh, walking back with the you know the, the bridle in your hand and not having the horse with you. And to make matters worse, I rode that horse every day the whole time we had him. I don't think, I don't even think the missus rode him work when uh, when we were back in Casino. And, you know, he went down there in the greatest possible condition we could have had him. He was, a you know, won his last start at Tamworth, um, running away from him. Rachel Murray didn't even touch him with the stick. He was just an absolute gentle giant. He was just a, he was a lovely horse to have around the stables. He, um, the only day he showed any sort of malice was the day he ran off the track at, uh, at, uh, Doom, but I think it wasn't through Jason Taylor over the yeah, outside yeah. bench. <laughs> I remember and that. Busted his shoulders yeah. and that. But uh, um, you know, he was just an absolute gem of a horse to deal with, and, and he had a, you know enormous ability. And to, to obviously, you know, was a, a big thrill to have our first runner in Sydney, and for it to, to turn around and uh, I guess end the way it did was um, was heartbreaking. I I got to admit, you know, I questioned whether or not continuing was a good idea um but uh i'll never forget that day uh, and i owe a huge amount of uh i guess praise to um darren beadman and john o'shea um john o'shea was obviously training for godolphin at the time had a million runners on the day um had plenty of horses he could have been saddling up and, and so did uh the beadman and uh the both of them come over to me like obviously went around to the to where the horse was and found out the news and had to you know front you know ten or fifteen owners that had made the trip down from up here to Sydney to watch the horse go around and you know I had devastating news for him um, and uh, you know I was pretty upset I was bawling my eyes out to be completely honest with you and uh, Beam and, o- and O'Shea come over to me and and I'll never forget it O'Shea grabbed me by the hand and shook me hand and put his arm around me and. Uh, and said, listen, mate, I know this is probably the hardest day you, you're ever going to have on a racetrack. Um, unfortunately, it's something that does happen and, and something that, uh, you know, accidents happen. And he said, this this will be the uh, the the turning point in your career. And um, he said, whatever you do, don't give it away. You, you know, I've been watching you for a while. I've, I've made a mind work for him. And so they'd been watching us, and, and that was only early days. And he said, mate, you, you know, you, you're a good young trainer. You, you're a good horseman. Uh, whatever you do, don't throw it away. And uh, he, I'll, I'll never forget that day. Never, you know, never forget what uh, John and, and, and Darren said to me that day. And, uh, you know, for them to take the time out to, to do what they did was, you know, outstanding. But uh, just just showed the, the true um, the true the people that they really are. Yep. It's yeah, great you know, bands together. Yep. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, people that probably wouldn't do that. But at the same time, you know, to every one of them, there's five or six people who, you know, they they want to they want to do the, you know, the, you know, the right thing and uh, and come and do something like that. And yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that day. And that, that was definitely hard. It's probably the one of the hardest days I've ever had. Um, it was like losing a child and. Uh, Probably the second hardest day was losing Torrens. I think I cried for about a week, which makes me sound like an absolute <laughs> sook. But uh, oh, it'd be know, tough it, in uh, your position, a young trainer, and you you think you've got horses which are going to take you to the next phase of your, of your career, and next day they're not there. Well, you know, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, you know, it, it I didn't see it coming, um, and. To get an email late at night that uh, the truck was coming the next morning to pick him up was a bit of a it was a, a massive shock. Um, 
and I wasn't too impressed about it. Um, to yeah, it's a little bit of a kick in the guts when you you know you've you've trained a Metropolitan winner with the horse three mm. starts back, yep. run second at Metropolitan Grade two starts back, and I guess flopped at its last start. But uh, Pengelly come back and said, look, he just his mind wasn't there, and that that prompted my um, my recommendation, my suggestion to geld the horse. Um, so. Uh, the horse was in the paddock. He was due to come back. And then all of a sudden, you know, everything's been t- tipped on its head. And, you know, it was hard. Um, but it's the first time it's ever happened to me. And I'm sure it won't be the last. Um, it happens in racing. It was around the exact same time as Fabergino was taken off that uh, Tiana Robinson and, and given to, to, to Chris Waller. So I'm sure she felt the exact same way. You know, she'd spent all of spring basically in, in Victoria would and you know it would have been hard with the lockdowns she, she wouldn't have been able to go home to Western Australia and you know she'd done a done a really good job with the horse and, and to have it taken off her and uh, for whatever circumstances it probably you know different circumstances of what obviously Torrens and I and the connections um the overseas connections um had with us but uh um yeah you know like it's it's hard but uh that's racing as they say and you move on and hopefully we find another one. I think, you know, we've got some, some really nice yearlings coming through. We've got a, a, a two-year-old by dissident there that, uh, funnily enough, we watched a webinar on uh, heart rate monitors the other day that Kira Ma did and um, it prompted us to go and dig a little bit deeper with our heart rate monitors and uh, we compared this partic- particular uh, two-year-old of ours to Torrens and um, the the data we had on Torrens and the data we have on uh, Midorio, although they were a year apart, is um, obviously we got the data was of Torrens as a three year old and this bloke's only two, um, almost identical. Like if you you know you took the the names away and, and put them over the top of each other, um, the data is like I said almost identical down to the point where you know they're like point zero one percent or point zero one whatever. Um, away from the other one. So we've got fairly high wraps on him, but his trial didn't reflect that. Um, but he did pull up Shinsaw from it, and it was a pretty boggy track at Lismore. So uh, forgive that trial. But uh, if he lives up to, to uh, what we think he can, um, you know, we, we've, we've got another one there, and we've got some, uh, or hopefully got another one there, and um, we've got some really nice yearlings coming through that we've uh, went on a bit of a shopping spree this year. And, yeah, I was going to say, looking through what you've got in the... In the... Um, on the website, you've got a couple of really nice, nicely bred yearlings and two-year-olds, so um, must be exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, uh, we've teamed up with Impact Thoroughbreds, and they uh, they bought us um, our top lot actually at the Magic Moons. That was a um, in book one, so it was a bit of a thrill to uh, to buy something out of book one and get it for a fraction of what the rest of the Hellbents were were selling for at the time, and. Um, the Invader bloke we bought out of book two, um, once again, you know, we bought him in a fraction of the, what the Invaders were going for up there as well. So, um, you know, they're two really nice horses with great pedigree pages and, you know, got a lot going for them as far as their confirmation and everything's concerned. They're in work at the moment. And, uh, yeah, we, we bought another Invader, which is actually half-brother to the Dissident that I was talking about. Um, we uh, we bought him out of the classics. Um, he's a really nice little cult. Um, bought an absolute cracking little Rubik filly out of the uh, Mel- Melbourne Premier sale for sixteen thousand. Got her for an absolute steal. Just uh, actually took her to the paddock today. Um, she's been broken in, had a, a little prep, um, and she'll probably have six or eight weeks out and come back and get stuck into it again. And a, uh, a, a little Churchill cult. We bought him out of the March Magic Millions. Uh, cutest sale so I uh, got him for $6,000 and a little bit of an ugly duckling but uh, got an absolutely unbelievable um, action on him and uh, you know big solid strong robust looking cult and uh, you know got him for a fraction of what the Churchills have been selling for too. And you mentioned the um, the heart rate monitors that you've been using on Midorio um, what kind of other technology do you use to monitor the horses and um, sort of get a gauge on where they're at? Oh, basically, technology-wise, the, the e-trackers are about the only thing we do use in that respect. Um, we don't have a treadmill, so I'd love to get into blood, uh, blood lactate, um, taking them and, and, and doing the blood lactate testing, um, but it's a lot harder to do in the field than what it is um, 
in you know under a controlled environment on a treadmill so um you know we're we're looking into getting a treadmill but at the moment um it's just not viable um for us to get one uh once we do I'll I'll definitely get into that side of things too that really interests me and uh we take um you know blood counts quite regularly you know um they'll gallop on say say a Tuesday before a Saturday race and we'll take the blood from the Wednesday see how they they handled the gallop see how they re, re, they've recovered from it see if we've got to um you know uh, fix anything up, you know, something might be a little bit low, so we, you know, might need a little bit of potassium for a couple of days or this or that or something else, you know, like if there's anything we can, uh, we can, we can bring up into the normal parameters or the, you know, optimum parameters. But, uh, basically that's all we sort of do is that, you know, we, the e-trackers, they're a great little tool. Um, and, uh, you know, they spit out, you know, just about everything you need to know or, or want to know as far as their, their work's concerned, their gallops. We, we we use them in all our gallops, but I'm starting to um, to use it a little bit more in the slow work on a few of the younger ones to, to sort of gather a bit more data about them before they sort of get to that point where they start to, to step up in their work and uh, we can sort of, you know, compare different things and, and stuff like that. So... Yeah, we sort of we we do a fair bit, but um, obviously limited due to you know uh, facilities. Um, but uh, the the bloods and the the heart rate monitors are something big that we we definitely use as far as the training side of things is concerned. And you mentioned you don't have a treadmill, but I saw on your website you've got a boat ro- a boat rower. Um, it's obviously you use him a bit in the uh, is it the Clarence River up there? No, we uh, I don't know what river we are here no. in Ballina actually. I've got no idea. Probably the Rich. <laughs> Probably the Richmond River. Yeah, it might be it. Yeah, yeah. I should have um, stayed out of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, she, see, I did well at geography. <laughs> um, there, we we've got a canal that basically runs right around the race track um, in the back of the um, not our stables, but um, the stables across the road. So um, Terry McCarthy, Stephen Lee, and all them across the, across the road, they've got the canal runs right past their back door, and there's a. Uh, uh, basically a vacant block of land between two of the houses straight across the road from Billy Folly's place. Um, and that's where everybody on this side of the road um, uses to swim their horses. So um, Dennis Dwayne or Sharpie as we call him, um, he, he's been a trainer here for a number of years. Um, he can, can row a boat really well. I, you know, he, he does a lot of the boat rowing around here. I can't. I go around around in circles. So I'm absolutely is it, is it, useless. Is it hard rowing a boat with horses? I guess they're, they're tied up to something on the boat, aren't they? How, how does it work? Well, no, no. Sharpie just uh, holds onto a big long lead. Um, so and they, you know, swim behind the boat. You, you, you've got to sort of break them into it. Um, some horses, obviously, they they don't. You know, um, they're not used to walking down a, a beach, so the, the white sand's a bit daunting for them at first. And then you throw a you know a big patch of water in in front of them as well. Um, that can be a bit daunting. And you know, we usually when we're introducing a horse to the water, it, it's sort of a three or four person job. You know, you've got uh, Sharpie row on the boat, and then um, one of the girls usually get in behind him because he tells me I'm too fat and I weigh the bo- back of the boat down. So. Uh, um, one of the girls usually get in behind him and hold onto the horse and make sure it sort of learns to swim behind the boat and not try and overtake it or something like that. But uh, um, once you sort of get him in there, he just takes them down himself and, uh, you know, they just go behind the boat on the on the lead and, uh, you know, he takes them in and he I make him swim a little bit different to what he swims him, his horses. But once again, you know, like I said earlier, each, each trainer has their different different way of doing things. But I swim sort of a little bit more like John Size does in Hong Kong. So I make him, so that for every minute they spend in the water, they've got to be out for a minute. Um, and they'll only go in for sort of one minute increment. So, you know, the, the longer distance sort of horses, they, they might have, you know, a three or four minute swim, but they'll, they'll be in, in one minute, out one minute, in one minute, out one minute, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, Shorter distance horses might, uh, they'll, they'll have, you know, two laps, basically. So two two minutes, minute in, minute out, minute in. Um, and, you know, there's a few there that sort of aren't the best of swimmers or they might have a few little back issues that um, might get aggravated by the longer swimming. So they might just have one minute or they might go a minute and a half or, you know, the horses that 
you know, they might be they they might be racing soon, and you might want to keep them that little bit fresher. They might only have a minute or a minute and a half, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, he he basically majority of the stable once they're broken into it, he just you know they'll they'll go out, they'll they'll walk, they'll 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 get saddled up, they go on the walker. Um, they'll have a sort of you know 15, 20 minute, half an hour walk. Um, then we'll pull them off the walker, jump straight on them, go out work them, come back. Sharpie takes them straight down for a swim. They come back and they have a, you know, a, a um, at the moment when, when it's cold, we've got a hot water system that they, so they get a warm bath and then they'll stand in the boxes for half an hour with the, um, oh, 20 minutes with the, the ice boots on and then they'll go back to their boxes. So, and if they have any sort of treatments like, you know, foresight or um, gastropella or anything like that, they'll get that before they go back to their box. But uh, basically, yeah, Sharpie just comes and grabs them out of the box and sings out how many laps are they doing and I'll, you know, someone will let him know how how long they got to go. Um, he hasn't quite worked out how to work, read the uh, worksheets yet, so um, he uh, someone's got to tell him. But uh, yeah, he just takes them down, swims them, they come back, and yeah, have a hose, ice spritz, go back in the box. Sounds like a, like a pretty big part of the day. But like, what what time do you start in the mornings there? Uh, so Alana, our we've only got one staff that works for. She starts at four o'clock, so she'll run around and uh, and give all the horses a couple of handfuls of hay just so they've got something to munch on before they get saddled up and go on the walker. It's it's good to keep the uh, stomach ulcers down um, when they've got a little bit of something in their, in their gut to sort of um, stop the, the, the acid and that slushing around in their gut. So um, uh, she'll go around and do that. And then uh, Jade and I sort of, Jade usually beats me over there. That's my partner. She, uh, she rides majority of the work. Um, she sort of beats me over there about, you know, four, quarter past four, gets the first couple on then we try and we try and get out there at four thirty if we can. The track opens at four thirty. Um but ninety percent of the time it's sort of more a quarter to five by the time we sort of um get it get the first four or five saddled up and on the walker and then, you know, they've had their time on there and pull them off and jump on them basically and then it's all systems go from there but uh the alarm usually goes off at 3 30 i need about 15 of them to get me up um i'm not a morning person by any means i've got to have two red bulls and uh, a <laughs> cup of tea before i get before i you know Preface get out of zombie mode but yep. yeah basically so you know a couple of bits of raisin toast or a couple of biscuits a cup of a cup of tea and as i walk out the out the door i grab a couple of red bulls out of the fridge <laughs> and throw them down so um yeah, basically that's you know we start then and uh, and you know have a couple of hours during the middle of the day off and start again. It's only Jade and I have an afternoon. We don't have any staff of an Arvo, so get stuck into them then. And you know we try and um, do majority of our updates and that sort of stuff of an afternoon. So, um, but you know if I'm up in the grandstand clocking one or Jade's up in the grandstand clocking one or you know Alana or someone's up there, we'll try and get as many videos and that is of them working as we possibly can. Um, but, uh, yeah, we do sort of all the updates and then the boxes and anything else that needs to be done of an Arvo. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty hectic of a morning, but, uh, how many horses have you got? Uh, got 15 in at the moment, I think, after I did the shuffle around this morning, um, we took a couple out and bought a couple back. I think there's 15 there. So, um. Yeah, we did have 25 before COVID, but um, unfortunately, when they sort of scrapped a lot of the non-tab races and um, there was a bit of a flow-on effect, horses that you know couldn't go to the midweeks were sort of coming back to normal old tab country grade, and um, obviously that meant that the tab country grade was stronger. So the normal horses that would go to a tab would come back to a half tab, and then the half tab horses were sort of you know didn't have anywhere to go after that, and the non-tab horses were basically obsolete. So we had to sort of a few that were sort of good little bread and butter horses that, you know, pick up a couple of half tab sort of races and, you know, were around the mark in the tab races that sort of just weren't cutting it anymore. And I, I you know, to look after the owners, I just said, listen, you know, we're going to have to move these horses on. We can't hang on to them. God only knows how long this um, bloody COVID pandemic is going to last for it. You know, it might last for a week. It might last for 10 years and, you know, we can't hang on to them for too long and it's just not a viable option to do it. So, we retired uh, a lot and um, and moved a lot on and basically went from 25 horses down to 10. So we, uh, you know, copped a copped a pretty pretty big reduction. But um, you know, we've sort of been been trying to rebuild from there and uh, you know we've 
we've battled on and it's been tough, but we're still here. That'd be tough because I'd imagine that you have plans to grow the stable. Yeah, look, you know, like um, I'd, I'd like to have plenty of numbers. I'm sort of, uh, I've worked for a couple of stables that have, you know, had, you know, that 60, 70 horses mark and I've been quite high up um, in that uh in, in those stables and I've learned how to manage numbers and um, sort of I like the challenge of managing numbers and that sort of stuff so obviously we'd like to you know get the numbers right up but uh, the, at the end of the day you know you can't just take on everything and you can't just keep sort of um, sending horses around for the fun of it at the end of the day the owners are going to jack up at some point and turn around and say you know enough's enough so you're better off knocking it on the head you know as, as early as possible and saving the owners as much as you can. And, uh, you know, they, they're more than likely they're going to they're come back and, and, and keep supporting you, you know. So uh, uh, it was it was tough. It was tough, definitely tough. And uh, obviously the, the bank account feels it too. You like uh, basically, basically we've worked out for every $100,000 that goes through the, the business account, um, Jade and I make $10,000 that we have to split between us. Um, so I think... Uh, not la- yeah, last financial year um, we had a really good year. We got 20 winners for the season from about you know 15 to 20 horses in work at any one time. So it was you know it was a pretty handy season. Um, so you know we, we had um, about you know a little over 600 thousand go through the bank account. So basically Jade and I worked for 30 thousand dollars each. You know seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, whereas. This time this year we're down around that two hundred and fifty thousand mark. So basically, Jay and I work for twelve and a half grand each. So um, it, it was tough, um, but we're not the only ones who's, who who've had to battle through COVID. Um, you know, there's plenty more in far worse positions than we we are in. Um, but we're starting to get the winners on the board again. The stable's starting to grow again. We're back up to that sort of fifteen mark and with a fair few still in the paddock to come in. And uh, um, we've, we've, there's a fair bit of interest around the stable again now that uh, the winners are starting to get on the board again too. So, um, you know, hopefully it starts to grow a little bit more again very soon. What's uh, Have you got a 10-year plan or five-year plan or what's um, what's the future look like? Have you got anything mapped out or just um, take it as it comes? Oh, look, I'd love to... I'd love to have my own sort of little setup um, where I can do my own thing and, and uh, you know, train the horses the way I want to train horses and not be sort of um, bound by, um, you know, oh, we've got to close the track today because such and such or blah, 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 blah. You know, like, if, you know, I'll, I'd love to have my own sort of setup on, on, a, on a property. Um, I'm sort of, you know, Jade and I are both, country kids at the end of the day so we'd love to sort of get back out on the land and um so i'd, I'd love to have a, a property set up with everything we need on it you know basically you only have to come to town um to to gallop them and everything else can be done at home um so that's sort of something that's definitely in the pipeline at the moment um there's some pretty significant upgrades being done uh, in in casino, uh, they're getting the the whole showground and racecourse um, precinct is getting a nine and a half million dollar upgrade through the um, the state government bushfire or federal government bushfire fund. Um, so if that goes ahead the way that they're hoping to, we've seen the plans um, and it's pretty schmick. Um, so. The likelihood of us being able to find the land to suit what we want to do um, at the right price is probably back home in casino. Um, obviously, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to set up a, a, a decent size stable out of casino and sort of put casino on the map as far as the racing side of things is concerned. Um, so, what's, uh, what's bigger? Is casino or Ballina bigger in terms of racing community? Um... Much of a muchness, really. Um, casino, casino probably is more local racing side of things. So a lot of the locals sort of support the locals in casino. Where here in Ballina, you know, it's sort of a, a different demographic. There's, you know, it's on on the coast, so everybody knows that. You know, the closer to the coast, the the higher the, uh, I guess, 
bracket of people with plenty of money is. So, and they're sort of, uh, I don't have a lot of owners here in Ballina. Um, matter of fact, I think only Midorio's half brother has Ballina locals in it. I think other than that, I don't think I have an, another, ba- uh, another Fair local right. Ballina owner. Um, Makes it hard for you, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sort of because we're so close to Queensland, Gold Coast, Brisbane, it's probably you know they they're sort of because they've got that higher um, demographic of, of of money, I suppose. Um, I guess COVID what, though hasn't helped hasn't helped getting um, interstate owners, has it? No. Oh well, sort of. It's it's a bit of a funny one. Ma- majority of my owners are not locals. Um, I've got a you know fair chunk of my owners are from Canberra. Um, I've got uh, two big syndicates, um, or sorry, one big syndicate and a and, um, couple of bigger owners that uh, are from Canberra. Um, a lot of owners in uh, Victoria as well, a few in Tasmania, a few in South Australia, a um, few in Queensland, but I don't think there's a hell of a lot in Queensland. Um, but uh, not, not sort of many local owners actually it's sort of um majority of our stable is basically interstate owners really so um but yeah the, sort of the locals around here they like to sort of you know get their horses with uh sort of queensland trainers because they're so close they can go to you know brisbane every weekend because it's just up the road you know so um a little bit disappointing It'd be nice to see them throw a little bit more support towards their local trainers but um I guess if I was in the same position, I'd probably do the same thing. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, you know, each of their own, you know, can't force people to do anything they don't want to do. And, uh, you know, obviously Queensland's pretty attractive at the moment and Brisbane's just out the road. So um, why not? I um, just want to touch back on your... your um, did you have a career career as a steward or was that just your, your, your mum was a steward? No, nah, just mum. Just mum. They wanted me to, they wanted me to, uh, to jump into it, but... Uh, I like this side of the fence and their side of the fence, so <laughs> it's a bit did, more did, exciting this side. Yeah, did you learn anything from um, those times in the stewards' room with your mums? Like, did you see any any ripping protests or barnies or anything? Or um, oh, I've seen a few, um, not none that are really memorable, but uh, there's there's been a few. I, I think the biggest thing that I got out of the stewards' room was. Um, the way you conduct yourself in a in a in a protest um, or in an inquiry, you know, um, a lot of people sort of go into a steward's room and it's and can be it can be quite daunting. Um, you know, you got two big stewards barking orders at you across the table, and um, people sort of get a little bit, uh, I guess, daunted, and it can be a bit nerve wracking. And then you go and you know you're trying to plead a case, you know, in a in a in a protest and stuff like that, and do is say the wrong word and, and the, uh, the the protest is thrown clean out the window and mm. uh, I, rem- I remember the day um, Norrie, um, Norrie and I were in a protest uh, Michael Costa protested, Michael Costa and Jake Bayless protested against us at Grafton and um, Norrie's sitting in the room and he's going oh maybe this, maybe that, maybe something else and I'm kicking him in the shin saying <laughs> don't say maybe, yeah. you know yeah. definitely if, if I did this definitely blah 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 and this definitely happened, this definitely didn't happen blah 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 and he's going he's poor Norrie's copped it in poor Norrie's copped it from you a couple of times isn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know he, he, it's just a, you know it's, it was a daunting experience for him and um, at the end of the day you know they never had any grounds to um, to 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 uphold the protest, um, you know, we, we won fair and square, you know. Um, Costa's horse come across and hit us. It wasn't the other way around. So it was always going to get thrown out. But, you know, if you, all you've got to do is say the wrong thing. And, you know, if he said maybe if I did yep. do something else, you know, that horse could have possibly beat us, you know. Like, they're, you know, the stewards are going to jump on that and go, well, yep. right, oh, you, Interpret you the wrong stuffed way. up. And, and, well, that's right, you know, and they, they're going to throw the race to... Uh, to the to the um, to the other party and we would have lost it, but uh, um, they don't they don't scare me because I've grown up with them and I treat everybody you know I don't care if you're the, the Queen of England or you know a peasant down the street you know like it's um, we're at the end of the day we're all getting we're all getting buried we're all getting burnt we're you know worms or fish are going to eat us so, you know we're all going to the same place and you can't take your money with you so 
um, you know, I obviously treat the stewards with respect, but I also treat them as if they're they're human. They're not a robot sitting across the table from me, you know. Yep. So um, do you want to get scared in the in the stewards room? No, nah, they don't scare me. Definitely don't scare me. So <laughs> you know, I think and and that basically comes from my time of of you know sitting in the room and 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 growing up with them. You know, like there's a couple of former stewards that aren't stewards anymore that uh, they're like you know like big brothers to me. You know, so. Um, because I grew up with them, but uh, um, you know, old Bill Fenning's probably like an old a, a grandfather to me because he babysitted me that that many times, you know. But uh, they, yeah, they they don't scare me, and uh, I think the way you know you learn how to conduct yourself and you learn how to stand your ground a little bit more by um, by by sitting through it. I, I guess it didn't it didn't really help me in respect that you know I, I know the rules of racing back to front, um, but uh, you know, you learn, you, you pick up things, you learn things along the way. And uh, I've definitely learned a lot from my time sitting in the steward's room and obviously time sitting in the swab box with mum as well. You know, you learn, learn different things from there. And obviously, you know, um, hanging around the traps, you learn different things off trainers talking and, you know, you listen to different things and you listen to jockeys and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I guess I learned a lot from, from just sitting there and sort of being a bit of a sponge myself, I guess, and, and taking in as much as I could. And, uh, yeah, I can't say that it helped me in any way that, you know, like I'm, I wasn't trained as a steward or anything like that, but uh, I definitely took a fair bit in, that's for sure. Yeah. Are you guys a big punting stable? Big punting stable? No, no, definitely not. I don't, I don't punt any of my horses. I haven't had a bet since uh, So Hot won, uh, since before So Hot won here in Ballina about, geez, that didn't really have to be four or five years ago now. Um, I used to back everything of mine. If I thought they were a chance, I'd have 100 each way on them. Um, if I didn't think they were much of a chance, I'd only have 50 each way on them for a bit of uh, moral su- support, I suppose. Um, but the day so hot won here, um, uh, Jim Timmons, who's been a, a, an owner with us since basically day dot, um, he, one of the loveliest men you'll ever meet in your life and a huge supporter of ours, um, he used to be the same, sort of, you know, if he thought they were a chance, he'd have a bit more on them. If he, if not, he'd just have a bit for moral support. But uh, so what's record in the wet was five starts for five distant lasts um, before I got him. Um, uh, we didn't think he could run in the wet and there was a heavy nine here at Ballina. Um, I said to Jim, look, this horse is absolutely flying at home. We've got to go to this race because I think we were aiming towards a Lismore Cup or, you know, a Grafton Cup or something like that. I can't remember. But uh, we had to go around regardless. He had to have the run. We, we couldn't miss it. It was 1,900 here at Ballina. He absolutely loved Ballina. But I said to Jim, look, mate, it's an absolute bog out there. Um, and we know he can't pick his feet up in it. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't bother having your 10 each way on him. So he didn't. I didn't have a brass razoo on him and the... The bastard got up and paid $21. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely romped in. Peter oh, Graham, dear. Peter Graham, rode, I, think he won, I think he won by about four lengths and beat a, the dollar dollar fifty absolute mudlark. And, yeah. and the trainer of it wasn't too, too impressed. She thought she had it <laughs> wrapped up and she was mouthing off down the day. So I said, listen, love, you've been beaten fair and square by a horse that can't even handle the wet. So I wouldn't be, wouldn't be carrying on like you are. But uh, ever since that day, I said, no, nah, I must be jinxing them. Yep. I must be jinxing them. That's it. I'm not having any money on them. And the only time I have had a bet on any of mine, or oh, only two tr- times since that I've had a bet on any of mine, was the Singaporean owner of Torrens used to get me to um, have 100 each way on him um, for him because obviously they couldn't bet uh, over there in, in Singapore um, on particular races. that You know, there was only sort of a limited amount of races, races they were allowed to bet on over there. And, you know, if he was racing at Port Macquarie or something like that, it was, you know, they, they just... They couldn't bet on him over there, so he'd send me some money over, and we'd bet. We, I think, I backed in the first start at the Gold Coast for him, and um, he never asked me after that. But when he won, I sort of was a little bit superstitious and went, "Oh shit, maybe I should have 100 each way on this horse every time it goes around." And I did for the first few runs, and uh, I, I did get a healthy, uh, healthy pay off a few of them because he, he wasn't uh, wasn't short in the betting for. Yeah, he's got a up at a couple of, them, of but... good odds, I think, hasn't he? Yeah, I think the day he won at Mool- uh, yeah, Moolum Bay, he paid about $14. And I think the day he won at uh, the Sunny Coast, he, he paid about 6 or $8, I think. So, But uh, that 
pretty quickly windled away when uh, he, you know that picket fence ended. So um, I, I pulled up stumps not long after that, and the only other time was uh, Winkler when he ran second at uh, the Sunny Coast. Um, Jade went away for a week, and uh, I had to ride all the track work. And Winkler wasn't really going that crash hot at the time, um, so um, I galloped him, and I hadn't rode work for a little while, and I sort of thought. This, this, this gallop felt good, but then I went, ah, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, Yiddy. You haven't rode a gallop for a long time. It just feels good because you haven't been in the saddle for a while. <laughs> so, but all week it sort of it bugged me, and uh, I went, ah. it just felt too good, you know. Like I didn't have anyone up there clocking them because mum and dad don't know how to clock them, you know, properly, and I'm very particular about where you clock them from and all that sort of stuff. So I sort of was only going on feel and. I went, geez, it, it just felt too good, you know, and I ended up having 50 each way when he got up at uh, run second, um, beaten not not far at the sunny coast that night, and I, I, he paid fairly healthy then. It was the day before my birthday, so um, it was a little nice little birthday present, and I owned a bit of him, and it was, I think it was Metropolitan Prize money too, so I think we got about 16 or 18 grand for running, uh, for running second, so um, it was pretty good, but... Uh, Look, you know, we're not a betting stable by any means. We've got some uh, owners that do like a punt. Um, I have tipped the a few horses to their owners. Um, I won't, you know, I won't, if, if say, for instance, Torrens was running tomorrow and I thought he was a really good chance, I wouldn't go and tell the owners of Midorio to back him. It's, you know, I think uh, it's unfair on Torrens' owners if I did it, but... Uh, the day Shiner won first up here at Ballina, Norrie rode him. He rode me first ever double, actually. Um, we uh, he, he won on partnership early on in the day, and he paid $9. Um, I I said to the owners, I don't think partnership will get beat in this race. Um, and he, he won, paid $9, and everybody um, cleaned up that day. Uh, and then I told the boys that uh, maybe they should have a little bit of what they won on Shinar because his form, his form on paper looked bad, but he, Josh Oliver got off him twice and said, listen, mate, I've done the complete opposite of what you told me to. I've slaughtered him. Just forget he even went around both times. Um, the good part about Josh is he's very honest. Um, and his runs were really, really good without, you know, to, to if you know what you're looking at, you would say that, he was definitely a, a chance in this race. and uh, But if you were just reading the form guide, you would have said he was not a hope in hell. But his work on the Tuesday was absolutely enormous. He ran, I think, 31 to the last 600 in his work under a stranglehold. Um, and I said to the boys, I said, if he replicates what he's done in his work to race day, he was a little bit... Um, a little bit... Uh, a little bit of a non-trier. Um, he, I said, if he, if he puts in today, he's, he's a chance. And, uh, he, some of the boys that were here at the races on the day had five each way on him at $60, uh, had five each way on him at $80. Every time he blew, he blew $20 and they had another five each way on him. Keep that. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, they did. And, uh, I think they, in the end, they ended up having a, about 50 each way on him at uh, anywhere from 60s to 150s. Little did they know that their both their wives are up in the member stand and they had 20 each way on him. Power played at 250. Oh, um, and um, a lot of the other owners had had a fair bit on him as well. Um, and, he, and he lobbed and got up at, I think he ended up about 125s when he got up. Um, but yeah, they, there was a fair few bottles of Moe, a fair few bottles, bottles yeah. of bourbon and, uh, a fair few big slings were, were thrown our way. So oh, nice. I know That's one particular want. owner, he, uh, he handed us, handed me a thousand dollars over the fence and he said, oh. uh, listen, this isn't, this isn't anywhere close to what I've won today. They don't even have enough money on course to pay <laughs> me out. He said, I know you don't take slings, so give half to Norrie and half to Jade. So I did. They, you know, Norrie got 500 and, and they got 500. And, um, yeah, there's been a few few times where that's happened. I think uh, um, Unleash the Red, basically the owners know that every time he blows to $20 and he's running at Grafton, just back him because he only seems to win when he's at $20 at Grafton. 
Um, so obviously they cleaned up the day he won first up and, and a couple other times, actually the day that Michael Costa protested against us, that, that day he won, um, he paid about $20 that day and I tipped into everybody, uh, Bensley and, uh, and Cozzy on, you know, on, uh, on Sky Radio. Tipped it to them and oh, uh, popular, he, blew from, uh, he blew from 15s to 21s and he got up. So Cozzy, Cozzy had a, a, a fat uh, fat day that day and rang me when I was on the way to Sydney um, taking partnership down there. He uh, he rang me on, me on my way down and said, mate, you're an absolute legend. I smashed him so, <laughs> nice. and got the 20. So, um, yeah, there's been... You know, there's been a fair few times where we've got it right, and and the owners have, uh, have definitely um, definitely uh, took a fair bit off the tab in the sports bet account, uh, sports bet companies. But uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, um, definitely not a big betting stable, and I and I definitely don't like to tip them unless I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really really confident. So, but uh, yeah, you know, like not uh, not afraid to tip one if I think it's uh, a chance. You've, you've got a few in on Tuesday at Lismore. I'm sure we'll get this podcast out before then. Anything you can tip the listeners or? Uh, Majestic Rapture, this is his second. Well, he had a one run for us last preparation. Um, he came up from uh, Victoria and he needed, although he's a five-year-old, he needed a bit of bit more time um i know that sounds stupid but uh he just he didn't come up in the greatest of conditions so we gave him one run and, and it was good um he ended up getting back to last at lismore and anyone who knows anything about lismore it's a front runner's track um got back to last come out in the worst part of the track and flew home and run about sixth i think um and that was a pretty handy little field too they they raced in too um then uh we we tipped him out we brought him back his work's um, improved a lot. Um, obviously, we didn't know a lot about him last preparation. I think we only had him for about a month all up in work. Um, but his it works improved a lot this time in. He's put on about 40 kilos. He's strengthened up. He's muscled up. Um, he looks a completely different horse than what he did last preparation. So, not saying that uh, he's you know going to turn the tables around and, and absolutely come out and blitz him um, on Tuesday, but it'll be interesting to see how he does run, um, and obviously he'll derive a lot of benefit from it, and, and we'll get a good gauge of where he's at. But off his work, I think he definitely can win a maiden this time in. Um, he definitely needs to, being a five-year-old, but only very lightly raced. Um, so um, you know he's probably not one to to watch on well watch on Tuesday, but definitely not probably a betting proposition um but definitely a watch to see see where he's at get a bit of a gauge on him lismore probably may not suit him um but you know you got to start somewhere that you know it's a nice little um race for him to uh, to kick start his preparation he probably wants a little bit further probably wants to step up to that more 14 1500 meter mark but um We'll be able to get a gauge of where he's at anyway. We've got to start somewhere. So, um, you know, it's only half an hour down the road to Lismore. So, um, you know, good little uh, good little kickstarter off for him. Um, spin that wheel has been an absolute nightmare. Um, he's got a lot of ability, but throws his races away at the start. Anyone who watched him at Warwick um, two starts ago where he threw Norrie... Um, you know, come out and wipe Norrie out on the top of the barriers and wipe himself out on the top of the barriers. We thought we were just going to win that race. Um, Norrie was more annoyed about um, the fact that he didn't win the last race of Warwick rather than all the blood that was spurting out of his eye at the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, a few little barrier issues there and cost himself the race at Grafton the other day. Uh, Caserta come back and he was filthy that uh, that we didn't win that because he, he read at the start and sort of missed it a half a length and he's a little bit slow to muster at times too when he gets it in gets it in a bit of a mood but um, definitely he was very uh, eye-catching when he won at Toowoomba uh, when he's made at Toowoomba and you know there's a there's a there's a nice race in him somewhere um, we've just got to hopefully he grows a brain at some point and uh, gets over these sort of barrier issues he's got but uh, he's definitely a, definitely a nice horse and one to one to follow, but um, you can't really follow him with confidence because if he, you know, if he blows the start, then you sort of yeah. You've, you've got he, a lot he of flew home up last, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Uh, hence, why we've sort of 
Caserta come back and said, well, maybe step him up to the mile. Um, he said he, he thinks that he'll run out the trip. I think he'll run out the trip, but he said at least over the mile, he's got that little bit longer to, to balance up and get over a tardy start. Um, he, he Caserta was of the opinion that, you know, had it have been 50 or 100 metres further, we, we win that race at Grafton the other day. So once again, thought we were going to Grafton to, to just win as well. But, uh, you know, you sort of, he's a, he's, he's an, a headache to put it put it nicely but uh none can run is a very nice little mare in the making she's just got a few too many brains for the barrier attendants around here um for some reason jade and i can get her in it in the gates by ourselves here at home but eight men can't get her in the gates at, <laughs> at the trial at the races so She's trialled against some, some handy horses and run second to um, two open company horses at the, the two times she did go in the gate. Um, thankfully, we got a pass last preparation, but she just um, suffered a little injury that needed a, 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 a bit of time in the paddock. Um, we thankfully picked it up before it turned into something major. Um, so got it at the right time, pulled the pin, tipped her out. The owners have been very patient because... She obviously has a fair bit of ability there. But really and honestly, I think it was a blessing in disguise. She's come back in a, a completely different horse. She's, um, she was a little bit small, a little bit weedy last time in. Um, but she's really furnished into a, an, a really nice little mare, uh, little filly now. Um, she's got, uh, you know, a lot broader across the chest. She's grown a heap. She's got a, you know, a nice, nice bum on her now. Um, you know, she's, she's really, she looks like a, you know, the real deal now where last time she was sort of doing everything, I guess on, you know, raw ability, she didn't know what she was doing. She probably still isn't 100% sure what she's doing yet because she's only had the two trials, but, um, she's definitely got a, a fair bit upside there and, and to do what she did in those couple of trials, I know they're only trials, um, but what she's shown at home and what she's shown in those trials and she's, she's definitely, uh, improved out of sight as far as uh, her um, build and everything else is concerned this time. I mean, I think um, she's, I think she'll be in in the right race. She'll be hard to beat. I, I'm just a little bit concerned with the track conditions over there in Lismore. It was a soft six yesterday. We had a storm here last night. Uh, I drove through Lismore to get to our farm uh, today. And although we only got a shower here, um, was only enough to sort of settle the dust. There was quite a few puddles sitting around Lismore yesterday and they've got it up a soft seven today. So this time of year, Lismore doesn't dry out very well. So it's so frustrating um, mate, getting all the rain up there. It just pisses down all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, look, actually, we haven't had a lot of rain here for a long time. Um, uh, it's been really, really good, actually. Um, but it sort of, we got all that rain at the wrong time of the year, sort of leading into autumn everything starts to cool down, so nothing really dries out well enough. Um, but really and honestly, as, as, as stupid as it might sound, Ballina is probably the, the best uh, best track on the Northern Rivers at the moment. It's sort of, it's holding up really, really well. It's dried out um, as best it, it possibly can. And, uh, you know, usually where the, where the, the boggiest and probably in inverted commas the worst track on the Northern Rivers at times, um, we're, we're definitely lengths ahead of uh, everywhere else here at the moment. So we're lucky here, but it's just, you know, placing the horses on the right tracks um, is a bit of an issue. So if if I'm happy enough with um, the track conditions in Lismore on Tuesday, she'll she'll definitely go there. I think a 1,200 fillies and mares maiden there would be a really good uh, little race for her. She's trialled there and actually gone in the gates there before and run second to a really handy um, open company horse there pretty sure that was the day she ran second to um the the better of the two um open company horses she's she's great um trialed against so um she's been there she handles the place she can put herself on on the speed um and like when she comes out of the gate she comes out like a shot out of a gun um it's just getting her in there is the issue yeah. so um if she goes in and she goes to lismore i definitely think um Regardless of the competition, I think she'd be hard to beat, actually, really, to be completely honest with you. But um, obviously, you know, there's a question mark over the track conditions and a big question mark over whether she'll go in the gate. Yeah. But, uh, you know, she just stands the ground and the, the boys are, you know, they just won't get in and push her, push her in because she, she, she kicked out once at Casino. That's why she got a bar on her. Unbelievable, to be completely honest. But uh, 
ever since then they've been a bit uh, bit gun shy to get in behind her. So um, I have to run around there yourself and put her in. If only they'd let me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, like if she goes in the gate um, and uh, and we go to Lismore, I think she, you know, she definitely um, definitely will be a force to be reckoned with. That's for sure. What about Unleash the Red? What's the plans with? Uh... Uh, he was a massive run at Grafton from the bag gate, carrying the 64 and a half kilos. Um, Norrie jumped off him and said, this bloke just loves Grafton, just keep bringing him back here. Thankfully, the carnival's on very shortly. I think it's the first day of the carnival's next Sunday. Um, so he'll go basically back to Grafton as many times as we can get him there. Um, he's... He's got his fair share of, or had his fair share of issues in the past, um, but he is the best with he, he has ever been. Um, he looks absolutely unreal at the moment. He's put on that much muscle. It's not funny. The scales keep going up and it's not fat, it's muscle because he, he just looks as tight as anything. Um, he's off his head. He nearly, you know, he tries to drop Jade nearly every morning and a couple of times Norrie's rode him and track work he's jumped off him and said Jade can have him he's too hard to deal with but you can uh, sort of tell he's a bit of a head case isn't he even by the, the like his racing style just his his head carriage he looks like a bit of a, a nut case doesn't he well he's not actually he's not but this preparation because he feels so good he's he's really okay. turning yep. it up and sort of got that grumpy old man um syndrome I think so yeah. <laughs> uh, he uh He's actually a lovely horse to deal with, but this preparation, he just, it just feels unbelievable. The, the Kairos, we, we've done a lot of work with him over the last couple of years, and the Kairos have finally, you know, usually they come and they say, oh, he's a bit, bit of here and he's a bit there and he's a bit something else, and the farrier come and go, oh, his feet are still a little bit, you know, shit out and this and that and something else. But uh, the last couple of times the Kairos and, and the acupuncturists and that have been here, they've gone, you know, this horse is the best he's ever been. He's absolutely spot on. Um he, you know, the 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 farrier. We've had very minimal problems with his feet this time, this time in, um, and he's just relishing at the moment. Um, don't know why everything's finally turned a corner, but I suppose you know, two years of hard work being put into him is finally starting to pay off. But uh, yeah, he's definitely starting to be a bit of a head case this time in. He's sort of um, not not so much in his races, but definitely at home, he's starting to give everybody a run for their money. He yeah. he nearly kicked. Uh, Nearly kicked one of Stephen Lee's uh, tracklet riders off their horse the other day, so he uh, he definitely doesn't discriminate on who he uh, who he wants to give it to. He, everybody was, knows that unleash the reds around. That's better than one of your track riders. Yeah, well, you know, probably shouldn't be saying it, but yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, he's he's fine. He'll probably head towards uh, South Grafton Cup. Though we might throw him in the South Grafton Cup. Um, if not, there's a benchmark fifty-eight over the mile down there. He'll get in fairly well at the weights. Won't carry 64 and a half kilos again, thank Christ. And uh, Norrie will jump on. And, uh, I, you know, off that last run, I think, he, you know, wherever he goes next, um, place right, he'd be hard to beat. Before I let you go, mate, um, as a young trainer, where do you see the industry in, you know, 10 years' time? And what are some of the challenges which um, you know, the industry's facing and needs to overcome to, to prosper over the next decade? Uh, look, I think... Racing's, you know, that we're always in the public eye, um, and obviously that you know that the, the uh, I don't know how what, how you politely call them, but uh, the um, the lefties, I suppose, um, they're always you know really you know keeping a close eye on what we do. I think um, a little bit more needs to be done in regards to educating people on the whip. Um, it's not a whip anymore, um, and I think we need to to show that. I, you know, um, obviously there's a lot of lot of going lot going on with whip, whip reforms and stuff like that. But I think there needs to be a bit more uni, universal sort of uh, across the board across Australia, and we need to, you know, be united in it. If you know one state's doing something, every you know all the states need to be doing the same. So we need to come at a um, a, a national sort of a agreement on that and the same thing needs to be done with uh rehoming i think um uh victoria is definitely lengths ahead of um the rest of australia i believe in in every aspect of of racing i think um you know people argue that new south wales is 
uh, is you know ahead of everyone else. But uh, I I honestly don't think that's correct. I think Racing Victoria have um, you know as you can see you know they've just brought all this sort of new stuff in with the, with the Melbourne Cup. Um, you know they've potentially sort of thrown a big spanner in the works with with, with the greatest race that you know in Australia and you know, but definitely in their state, um, their centrepiece, I suppose. And they've, you know, they're, they're not scared to, um, to to make sure that they're crossing their eyes, uh, crossing their T's and dotting their I's, you know, so, and making sure they're doing the best they can. I think their rehoming um, protocols and system they have down there is, is length ahead of everywhere else. I, I'm unsure whether Queensland even really has a rehoming um, thing. I think, I think they need... probably, yeah, probably not as... Um... Well, no one is Victoria, I'm sure. No, no, and I think I think they need to, you know, if they do have one, um, I'm, they they've got something, but it's obviously not as, um, you know, as as advanced as um, New South Wales and Victoria. But they need to be starting to make sure that they're letting everybody know what they're doing. I think Queensland's, I think Queensland's almost about to overtake New South Wales. Um, people will laugh at me, I know, but uh, I think. They're starting to realise they've got to dot their I's and cross their T's a little bit more, and I think they're building on things. Um, and I don't think they're the laughing stock that they used to be here, you know, sort of two or three years ago. I think they're really starting to up their ante. You know, if they if they get their this this track upgrade at uh, the Gold Coast, what they're supposed to get, you know, it's going to really they're going to be a force to be reckoned with too, um, Queensland. But I think the biggest thing they need to do was that in New South Wales is they need to stop buying farms to put horses in to rehome them they need to start making sure that their tracks are you know as at the absolute optimum they can be and and that's one thing victoria has got they've i i believe victoria's got the best tracks in australia um and i think you know there was a bit of an argument um over the sort of um autumn carnival where you know they they shunted the races back those couple of weeks, the, the the whole carnival, the championships back those couple of weeks because Rose Hill and Randwick just they just don't handle it anymore. And the the problem with New South Wales is that the tracks are just dated, and that's as simple as it gets. And and they need to they need to be making sure that less horses are going to these rehoming farms by making sure that you know their their tracks facilities. Are are, yep. Yeah. So instead know, of like, new instead of new grandstands and big races like the Everest, they should. Um perhaps invest money into the tracks. Yeah, I don't think I don't think anywhere needs I don't think Australia needs the Everest. Um, you know, it's I don't think country racing needs a Cosy Osco, to be completely honest. I think if the one point five million dollars was was spent at a particular track each year, I think um, my belief is you've got to have the facilities to get your horses fit to go there. And if you don't, you're not gonna get there. So all you're gonna do is all you're doing is catering to people that you know that 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 small group of top range people um, in Scone and sort of Tamworth where the money is getting spent, and the rest of us, you know, we we can't we we're just simply not getting there because you know we're dealing with you know tracks where we can't gallop them because it's too wet or this and that and something else. I think the future's in these poly tracks. Um, there's been a great um, report on poly tracks, and I think they need to be scattered out a little bit more. I think. That I don't know about um, sort of uh, injury rates with the poly tracks and that, but I think if if they're as good as what everybody makes out they they are, it's sort of a universe sort of um, surface to be working them on. It doesn't matter if it's wet, cold, dry, hot, whatever. It's you know you get the exact same thing every time you go over it, and I believe they're fairly low maintenance as well. So I think more of those should be put in be put in for, for, you know, in training facilities, which might take a little bit more pressure off, you know, your grass tracks and that sort of thing, which um, in turn, if you, you know, if you're taking a bit more pressure off your grass tracks, you're going to get a lot more better, fairer, fairer racing. But I think uh, racing New South Wales definitely needs to have a look at their tracks because um, they're just dated and that's as simple as it gets. And you can see it like, you know, you, you watch Rose Hill, you, they take an aerial shot of Rose Hill and, and Randwick on a Saturday and, you know, it looks like a, a ploughed up paddy. Um, whereas you look at Flemington and, and uh, Mooney Valley and Caulfield and they look like a bowling green, you know. Yep. So they need to need to be starting to... Prevention is better than the cure, that's for sure. So they need to start to 
spend more money on tracks and a little bit less money into the uh, the pockets of uh, the rich and famous with these Everest and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, they're the ones who, who need it less than the guys like out at um, Ballina, like you guys. So, yeah, um, you know, like, you know, it'd just be it'd just be nice to see. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we can, if we've got, if everywhere's got better facilities, we have a better chance of, of winning more races. And at the end of the day, you know, if we can win more races, we're gonna, you know, we, you're gonna get as much money as tr- winning a, you know, Cosy Oscar yeah, or something exactly. like that. You're not, yeah. probably not it's gonna more, get more sustainable. That's yeah, most, right, you know. Yeah. I'd much rather win, you know, more eleven thousand dollar races around here than try and bust me guts to go to a Kosciuszko and and yeah. um, you know, with with horses that are working on sort of inferior um, tracks that uh, that the other fellas have got. So yeah, I just th- I think um, racing needs to start. To, I think if we're going to look at the welfare of horses, they need to start looking at the the you know where they start and not worry about what happens to horses when they're finished. Obviously we need to worry about that, but we need to start looking into why these horses are finishing and finishing prematurely and prevent that, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if you, if your tracks are 100%, you know, you, you, you're probably going to, instead of having 15 farms with, you know, 500 horses on each of them, uh, which is not sustainable by any means, um, you know, you might have three farms with 50 horses on them, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's gonna. It's a lot easier to rehome a sound horse than it is to, to rehome a horse that's even got a very small um, injury. It might might be minute and mightn't affect it in anything um, that it goes into in later life. But the the showy people that you know they want perfect, yeah, perfect, horses. perfect, perfect. Yep. You know, so um, it's uh, and you know if if um, the the new owners don't have to spend a lot on rehabilitation or that sort of thing, they're going to be more inclined to, to you know, take Re-invest. on more horses. Yep. Yeah, so, um, you know, like, yeah, I think uh, the rehoming thing needs to be really looked at um, and start, you know, start from scratch. Uh, ask yourself, you know, racing needs to ask themselves why these horses are getting it. Obviously, you get your, your you know, your old horses that just, they've reached their mark or they just, they don't have it. Like, they're not, they're just not fast enough. They don't want to be race horses and, they go there, but uh, as far as horses that go there, you know, they retire with injuries and stuff. Um, like I said, it's a lot harder to rehome them from a trainer's point of view, um, and it's going to be a lot harder for for the re, you know the rehabilitation farms to to rehome them, and it's going to cost racing a lot more money to rehabilitate the horses to get into the point where they're rehoming them. So I think a lot more needs to be done with tracks, um, and a little bit less needs to go into the the pockets of the the rich and famous. And you know, start spreading it around a little bit more. But uh, as far as prize money is concerned, you know, everywhere's, you know, Queensland starting to lift the bar. New South Wales is always lifting the bar with their um, prize money. Victoria is the same, and you know, we probably need to continue in that respect because everything's getting more expensive, um, especially after COVID. Um, so you know, it needs to be justifiable for for people to come into racing. They need to be, you know needs to be some sort of carrot dangled in front of them. And uh, that, you know, I think racing's doing a good job with that, but I think they need to start looking at a, a bit more in New South Wales in particular, a bit, little bit more into um, the safety of horses. Yeah, yeah, safety of horses and riders at track work and, and in races. So, um, yeah, a bit more money spent on the track would be good. All right, mate. Well, um, might wrap it up. Had a good chat there, but, um, yeah, good luck. on well, firstly on Tuesday at Lismore, but, um, more importantly, best of luck into the future. It sounds like you've got a good crop of young horses coming through, so hopefully a few stars there. Yeah, no, we've uh, definitely uh, definitely got a nice crop of young ones coming through and we'll definitely be looking at uh, building on that for the sales to come. Perfect, mate. All right. Well, thanks for your, thanks for your time. Um, no, best thanks of luck. For having me. No worries, mate. Thanks Take it easy. Me. You too. Thanks, mate. At Winning Edge Investments, our team of highly skilled expert analysts and full-time professional punters review the data, crunch the figures, assess the best betting opportunities, and deliver them to your phone via our app and your email inbox in real time so you profit. Go to www.winningedgeinvestments.com, look at our membership options, 
make your choice and enter the promo code PODCAST to receive a special 25% discount on your first membership just for listening. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T in capital letters for a 25% ongoing discount on your first membership. Treat your betting like a business and invest intelligently with Winning Edge Investments.